Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our daily briefing. Today I'll provide the update regarding the usual set of facts that Dr. Ngazi Azike and I present together each afternoon, and then I'll be happy to take any questions. Today we're reporting 2,126 new cases for a state total of 43,000 903, which includes many individuals who have already recovered. We continue to have 96 counties with known cases out of our 102 counties in the state of Illinois. 13,335 new tests were reported over the last 24 hours. And I'm deeply saddened to report 59 lives lost in the last 24 hours for a total of 1,933 fatalities in Illinois since the beginning of this pandemic. May their memories be for a blessing. In terms of the number of COVID-19 patients and assumed COVID-19 patients in the hospital in any condition, whether mild or serious, as of midnight last night, that number was 4,595. Of those, 1,267 are in the ICU, and 772 of those ICU patients are on ventilators. Stay healthy and safe, everyone. Please remember to wash your hands frequently throughout the day. Wear a face covering if you intend to be in public uh, so that you can protect everyone around you and maintain social distancing of six feet or more. Dr. Ezeke and I will be back here tomorrow for our regular update together. And now I'll be happy to take any questions from members of the media. Will? Hi, Governor. Will Jones from ABC7 Chicago. Have you seen the video circulating on social media showing a large party? Apparently here in Chicago, people are standing shoulder to shoulder listening to music. Granted, some are wearing masks, but most are violating social distancing guidelines. Have you seen that video? I have not seen the video, though I did hear about it. What is your reaction to that, people violating these social distancing guidelines and having large gatherings? Well, first I want to remind everyone that um, by doing that, by standing together, uh, not social distancing, many people not wearing masks, you're literally putting everyone around you in danger. You are. They are putting your, you in danger. And very importantly, all of those people are putting their families and their friends who are not there with them in danger because COVID-19 works like this. First, you are asymptomatic. You are a carrier and you might feel just fine and you'll go home, you'll feel fine and you might give it to people at home. You'll see your friends, you feel fine, you give it to one of your friends or more. Uh, and then you are a spreader of COVID-19. The whole purpose of social distancing, of wearing masks, of staying at home, in fact, um, is that we don't want to spread this to our loved ones or to others in the community. So I would uh, suggest that all of those people have violated not only the uh, intention of the order that we've put out, um, but, but also they've violated the trust of their friends and family. Are you concerned as this order stays in place for the next several weeks, people are going to be tired of following these guidelines and more people are going to be violating them, going outside, not observing social distancing, having large gatherings? Do you have a plan in place just in case that becomes a bigger problem as we go on? It, it, we have the ability to enforce these things. We've chosen to allow people to self-enforce, to do the right thing. Um, we obviously have asked the, the uh, police and other law enforcement to remind people when they see them, uh, when they're not following social the, the new social distancing norms and not wearing a mask that they need to do those things. And then finally, the police do have the ability to um, you know, ultimately to enforce that uh, with people. Um, and that's, you know, not just 
with the ability to remind them. But if they refuse, and if they repeatedly refuse, there is the ability by the police officers to charge them with reckless conduct and take them into custody. Though, again, we have discouraged police from doing that um, because we believe that people will, in general, follow the rules. But if you're putting the community in, in danger, as a party like that does, that should be broken up. All right, I'll get to some other questions. This is from Greg Bishop at centersquare.com. With a hearing in state representative Darren Bailey's challenge of your authority Monday and the possibility that other cases challenging your authority could percolate, how quickly should the state Supreme Court take up the challenge? Shouldn't they take the case quickly if this is about public health? I think that the courts uh, need to follow through on this. They, you know, the obvious answer to this, frankly, is that the governor has the authority to uh, issue a disaster proclamation and to put in place executive orders that are all about saving lives. Um, we've done that for many years in this state when there have been floods or other disasters, that sometimes those floods and the disaster that's attendant with the floods have lasted for multiple months and we've extended those orders around that. This is worse than that and obviously has threatened the lives of 12.7 million people in the state. This is from Benjamin Zamora, Telemundo, Chicago. Governor, with the scaling back at McCormick Place, what is going to happen with the nurses and staff hired for the 2,000 beds? Will we see any cuts there too? Um, we're actually redeploying many of the people that are were hired for the extra beds, the ones that we're not uh, going to build out. We're redeploying those personnel to other areas of need, uh, including uh, needs around nursing homes and other facilities that we have across the state where, because of sickness, there may be a, you know, a reduction of staffing. We have two questions from Amy Jacobson with... WIND Radio, a follow-up from her question yesterday. Dentists around Chicago are extremely confused after your comments yesterday. They've all been waiting for your green light to open. You said they closed down on their own. Can you clarify that, please, and can they get back to work for more than just emergencies? They can. I said that yesterday. I'm happy to reiterate it today. Her final question, can those offices have access to the overstock of PPE? Uh, they have their own stock of PPE. They have their own sources of PPE. Um, as many as as I think people know, what the federal government did with their air bridge is bring in uh, uh, PPE from abroad and give it to the distributors. Those are the distributors that normally supply dentists and doctors and hospitals and so on. Um, and so there is PPE available through those distributors as a result of that uh, air bridge. Um, there are other facilities that don't normally carry any PPE, um, and those facilities are have reached out to their local county departments of health, which reach then out to the Illinois Department of Public Health if they don't have enough in stock, and so we resupply them. Okay, questions from online. Whip at the mix. Governor, have you been watching the Michael Jordan Bulls Last Dance documentary on ESPN? If so, what do you think of it so far, and are you looking forward to episodes three and four tonight? I desperately want to watch this. I have not gotten around to it. I have to admit I've been a little busy. Jacob at KSDK, have you spoken with Governor Parson about plans for Metro St. Louis and how the two states might work together in that region? Um, I, I have not. I know that he's gone in a different direction than we have. Um, we obviously have challenges, uh, you know, on our side of the border. Um, it, you know, it's likely because of the differences between the two states' orders that there's been, you know, more of a hot spot on our side. But it's unclear about that. Um, what I do know is that we're coordinating. The county health officials there are coordinating across the boundaries. John O'Connor at the AP. On Thursday, your team told me there were 2,250 beds at McCormick and the rest would be installed last week. Yesterday, you indicated that not all had been installed of the original 3,000 beds. How many are installed and are you done installing them? And will you do any installation at Vibra in Springfield? Um, again, we're 
keeping at bay the facilities like Vibra um, with the thought that we may need to spin those up at a later date, but right now we don't need to. Um, so uh, with regard to McCormick Place, we essentially have two halls. We've been working, obviously, across three different halls at McCormick Place. Original plan was 3,000 beds. We now are focused on two halls, 500 beds each. They're slightly different. One of them is a hall that is what I would describe as, just by visually, I would describe them as regular hospital rooms. Um, they have, uh, you know, for low acuity patients that have been transferred there from hospitals because they uh, no longer need the full breadth of offerings that a hospital has. Um, the other hall has 500 beds, and those beds can be used either for lower acuity or higher acuity, and those are negative pressure tents um, over each one of these rooms, essentially, that allows the um, you know people who have COVID maybe in a more serious condition, if they were to graduate into that um, from another part of uh, McCormick Place, uh, and it's, a, again, a higher level of care. Um, and a liar, higher level of uh, equipment that's in those rooms. Um, that's what we intend to make sure are uh, live and working every single day right now. Uh, again, we have the ability to move into the other spaces that we had planned, but, um, but it does not appear that we will need those, at least in the immediate future, so we are not going to uh, staff those or fully build out the rest of those. Hannah at the Daily Line, Governor, there has been conflicting guidance from you and IDPH on who can get a test. You said that now everyone who has COVID-19-like symptoms can go get a test, but guidance put out on IDPH's Facebook page and other places says you must also have a com compromised immune system, comorbidity, or known contact with someone confirmed to have COVID-19. Which is it? It's the former, um, but I also want to add that uh, in addition to having uh, people who have COVID-19 symptoms get tested, um, we also have the ability for first responders who are in any condition to get tested. We want to make sure that they have that opportunity wherever they may be, and we've expanded, as you know, across the state, places where both of those types of folks can go get a test. Shia from Politico, what do you see as the three top areas that need to be addressed in a revised state budget? The three top areas that need to get addressed? Um, well, we're certainly, you know, revenue has been a real challenge, um, and we're looking to uh, for help from the federal government. I've talked about that frequently. Um, these are, you know, revenues that, uh, that were lost as a result of coronavirus uh, because the budget that we had proposed originally was a balanced budget based upon the revenues that were projected to exist, you know, with, in the absence of coronavirus and before we knew it. Uh, was among us. Um, so revenue certainly is a challenge. Um, you know, I, three things to, to cover. I'm not sure I would say there are three. I, I do think that, you know, we're looking at all the areas in which there may be uh, need to make cuts or, or changes to our state budget in order to make it balanced. Um, you know, this is a, an extraordinary undertaking. Uh, and so we'll be coming out with, um, you know, guidance about that as we uh, work together together with the legislature, which we're doing now, in order to put together a budget uh, for, by the way, an adjusted budget, an adjusted uh, situation for 2020, as well as the new budget for 2021. Dave McKinney at WBEZ. Including today, Dr. Deborah Burks did network interviews since the president mused about disinfectant or light injections as possible COVID treatment. She hasn't disavowed his statement. Do you maintain faith in her as coronavirus task force coordinator? She's highly educated and, and certainly, I think, uh, seems to have very good intentions. Um, so I, I think, you know, I have faith in her. I must say that I, I personally, I think Dr. Fauci has been a, um, a, a very reliable source of information. I have spoken with him directly one-on-one -on -one a couple of times already. And, uh, and I, you know, and I rely, you know, I rely on the guidance that I hear from him. I re rely on... Uh, uh, 
you know, what the task force, or at least I listen to what the task force uh, puts out. And then the CDC is still an excellent organization and has excellent intentions, seems to be non-political, although they've had political uh, clampdown upon them with regard to, uh, you know, their interactions with the media, which is disappointing. But uh, but those are the, fo- you know, those are at least at the federal level folks that I would rely upon. I was glad to see, I think we all saw some of the facial expressions that Dr. Burks uh, made during the comments of, by the president. And I think that's some indication of what her real feelings are. One more from WBZ. Do you have any reaction to yesterday's tweet from former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley about Illinois not deserving federal relief because of the state's reckless spending, including on pensions? I want to know if uh, members of the Republican Party in Illinois agree with her that Illinois doesn't deserve to get any federal help. That's what I want to know. Rebecca Anzel at Capital News Illinois. Governor Pritzker answers many questions from reporters daily, and I'm wondering if there's something we have not asked about that he would like to add, highlight the importance of, or dispel in the case of rumors or incorrect information being circulated. Oh, gosh, I didn't come with an entire list of all the rumors and speculation uh, to address. Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I try to be as transparent and as I can be and answer every question that, that I'm posed. Um, I stand up here every day, you know, uh, probably for too long, but you all ask questions and I answer as many or even all of them actually every day. Uh, Jim Haggerty at Rock River Times. Governor, how can gyms and fitness centers be prepared to reopen safely when the restrictions are lifted? I think it will be um, obviously very strenuous. I mean, I can't tell you exactly because I'm not in that business. I don't understand uh, exactly how all of it works. I certainly have been to a gym on occasion, uh, and I can say that uh, you would have to have some a lot of uh, uh, staff, frankly, uh, to wipe down everything on a constant basis, uh, you know, to make it uh, sanitary for people. And I know that's extremely difficult. I mean, equipment gets um, dirty with people's, you know, with with, uh, fluids that come from people. And and I think it would be just an extraordinary undertaking, but it is necessary if we were to, you know, reopen those. And at some point, and we no doubt will, um, we would need to make sure that people are safe, people who work there as well as people who are using the equipment. Mike Militich at Quincy. In the last week, the Rockford area has seen Rochelle Foods and other large facilities close or announce numerous cases of COVID-19. Are you treating these areas as hot spots? What is being done to stop the spread of COVID-19 there? We certainly are treat Rockford is, you know, if you look at the map, Rockford has quite a number of cases. Uh, Winnebago County has quite a number of cases. And so, you know, whether you call something a hot spot or not is is kind of irrelevant. The question is, is it an area you're focusing attention on? And the answer is, of course, we are. Um, It concerns me when there's an outbreak in one facility as well as in an entire community. Uh, So uh, we, of course, are advising keeping in close contact with the county uh, public health department as well as the elected leadership in the area Um, and you know we're paying close attention obviously to um, the um, food supply and uh, the supply chain for food to make sure that it continues and that it's safe okay this is our last question from dave Dahl at wtax governor how should how should teachers and administrators use their time this summer with regard to preparing for the fall ramping up e-learning in-person learning both um, i would prepare for both because it is still unclear um uh, you know what things will look like over the summer and the fall but um but without knowing uh, the the answer e-learning is an important thing for us to develop either way and i think we've seen that you know in this short period of time that we've been in this covid uh, crisis you know really about two months uh, and and only in a stay at home or at least uh, uh, you know canceling school uh, for you know five weeks I think so um, what we've learned in that short period of time is that many many schools are not ready for e-learning uh, but should be and so the state actually has funds available to help school districts to work with school districts to help spin up e-learning I mean I would encourage uh, administrations and uh, teachers to work very hard on making sure that's available um, just in case and also because 
because uh, I think that in the future we'll be using e-learning more and more, even in the absence of a pandemic, um, along with in-person learning. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Governor Pritzker's daily coronavirus update, 2,126 new COVID-19 cases in Illinois, 43,903 cases in the state altogether. 59 people have died of COVID-19 in the last 24 hours, 1,933 deaths in Illinois since the beginning of the pandemic. We'll be here with the latest on our news at 5.30. Until then, stay up to date online at CBSChicago.com. I'm Jim Williams. Be safe. This has been breaking news from CBS2.